WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I am Tia Graham, and all week long I have been joined by Vicki Thomas, the first black woman in radio inducted into the Michigan Hall of Fame broadcast journalism. Broadcast, excuse me. And yes, then as Hall well, mm-hmm. exactly, Hall of Fame. And then <laughs> she is the director. Okay, of communications for the city of Detroit. I want to say thank you once again for being here all week with us. It's been a pleasure to I, share the mics with you. I can't believe this is the last day. I know. It went by <laughs> so fast. It's been great. Oh, but yeah. we have some stuff happening on the show today. Yes. Coming up on the show today, Detroit's uh, director of DDOT, we are we'll be talking about a $30 million grant from the bipartisan infrastructure law to purchase hybrid and hydrogen buses. And we'll talk about that with the head of DDOT later in the hour. As well, Hoop Fest, Hoop Fest is happening this weekend. We'll chat with the organizer about the important it holds in its community and the all-star appearances they'll have this weekend, including former NBA star and U of M player, Fab Five player Chris Webber will also be in attendance this weekend. So excited about that. We have so many cool things happening today. Yes, a lot going on this weekend, too. The city of Detroit is no stranger to vacant neighborhood lots that are sometimes eyesores. Many Detroiters have taken these spaces into their own hands, transforming vacant lots into gardens, small parks, and even community tree houses. (laughs) Since the fall of 2022, the city of Detroit's neighborhood beautification program has supported residents in these transformational efforts. Tammy Black is one of those residents. She is the founder of the Manistique Community Tree House in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. Her treehouse project will be a 700-square-foot, wheelchair-accessible, six-sided building. Ramps and platforms will extend from the sidewalk up to the structure and surrounding decks. To tell us more about the project now and the importance of Detroiters reclaiming their communities is Tammy Black, the founder of the Manistique Community Treehouse. And Tammy, welcome to the Metro. Thank you for having me here at the Metro. I am very excited to share with everyone about our Manistee Community Treehouse Center for people with disabilities with an inclusion of everyone else. And I am so excited to be a part of the neighborhood beautification where there's grant money for individuals who's turning property, blight property into beautiful spaces um, for their community because who knows our community better than us? And I'm very happy to be a part of that. And the Treehouse Project, let's get back to that. (laughs) The Manistee Community Treehouse Center will be a space like no other in the city of Detroit. It will have a beautiful landscaping. It will be ran by solar power because that's one of our missions, right? Um, So for the environment and also putting people to work in our communities in this field of um, of sustainable energy. So um, the tree house will be um, a place for meeting, a place for relaxation, a place for mental health, believe it or not. So if um, individuals who are seeking um, mental health services or just need someone to talk to and they want to have their treatment at the tree house center, they can seek our uh, mental health providers and have that service at the Treehouse Center confidentially. And that's one of our services there that will be there. And also we'll be having events, uh, like I said, again, relaxation spaces, beautiful landscaping. And it's for the community. It's not just for Jefferson Chalmers. It's for anyone who wants to be in a space of relaxation where they can be themselves and an inclusion of people with disabilities because everybody has a skill regardless of what their level is. And we And why, to, why was it so important, Tammy, for you to make sure that uh, it was ADA accessible? 
I am compliant. a mother of six children who are considered slow learners, which they're not slow learners. They're brilliant people. And me being an advocate for people with disabilities started my wheels to turning at this blight property across the street from my house. And me being a person that loves treehouse masters with Pete Nelson, I said, okay, <laughs> all right, here we go, yeah. mama. <laughs> I love it. You're going to create a treehouse center for people with disabilities. You're going to make this place solar because you love solar so much. And you know that it could be beneficial to people saving money and actually saving their environment. You're going to have financial literacy inside of this place because None of us in, 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 in the city or who came from Mississippi with our families know about financial literacy, stocks and bonds and mutual funds and, and how to create a trust. Why don't we know this? Why our kids don't know this? So mama went to, went to, went to work on that. And so those are what some of the things that are offered going to be offered in the Treehouse Center as well. And also workforce development for solar installation. That's a thing that's offered going to be offered in the tree for the for the treehouse center as well and that brings community to that brings people in the community to getting high paid jobs to being a part of the 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 industry that's going to be um taking over from fossil fuel so and people with disabilities will be a part of this as well so it started my wheels to turn i can talk all day you guys yeah. now <laughs> i love it though. i love it we so, can tell that you're passionate about yes this. yes i am very very passionate about um detroit i'm very passionate about our communities i'm very passionate about our people of all of all abilities um there is no bias um, when you come to the Treehouse Center, you leave that on the other side of the curve. That's what we say. We only talk about productivity and creativity and being yourself no matter who that is. So um, mistakes are meant to be made and they're meant to learn from. So that's what we that's what we focus on. And I am definitely Detroit for life. I love that. <laughs> and uh, Detroit for Life is part of our marketing campaign Yes, uh, to really highlight programs like the Neighborhood Beautification Program that are funded with ARPA dollars, um, ARPA dollars from the federal government. And uh, Tammy, so, you know, a lot of residents rely on the government for so much. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the importance of residents getting involved to reclaim their neighborhoods. I think that's the best thing ever is for the residents to get involved in reclaiming their neighborhoods because who know the neighborhoods better than the residents? Right. You know, you can bring in somebody who can give you the spiel about what it should be, how it should look, how people should feel, but the people who are there and live there and commute there and visit there every single day know what they need and they want, and we need to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what we do. And talk about your experience in applying for the Neighborhood Beautification Program and just what it means to you. Uh, my experience in applying was, it was easy. It was, it was an easy, they made it as easy as possible for us to be able to apply and to be able to show what we want to do, how we would like for it to work out in our communities. And if you didn't understand something, they were... It, the team was immediately on top of you understanding how to apply, how to make it happen. This is one of the best things that ever could have happened for communities who have the blight property and want to turn it into something that's going to be beneficial to the people there. And um, how did they help you in terms of uh, realizing your vision for the treehouse? The funding, $15,000, mm -hmm. helped us to realize our vision for um how we wanted to lay it out. Um, what could that fifteen thousand dollars be used from to for to help us com complete our mission? So it it was beneficial in that way. Now let's talk about the structure. It's going to be ten feet off the ground and will be totally powered by solar energy. This will be an active community-run center for occupational therapy and education, as you already explained. Why is it so important to have these services right in the neighborhood? I, sometimes you can um, have spaces that you think people would want to visit and do things that you 
feel that's beneficial to them, but actually it's not. When it's coming from somebody that they live next door to or that's right there in the community with them, that's with, with the struggle and been through the struggle and still dealing with the struggle, they're more apt to take advantage of what you're offering. Right. And that's what I feel is so important because I'm right there. We're, the people on my team, they're right there. We're not going anywhere. We live here. We know the struggle. We know the needs. We listen because we are the, we are the people who are needing these things. Mm-hmm. So I think that makes a whole difference when we're doing these projects and when we're trying to reach the people. Tammy Black is a longtime advocate and the founder of the Manistique Community Treehouse. And Tammy, talk about the the lots that you have, because you have some outside of the neighborhood beautification program that you uh, developed. Um, Talk about how many you have and um, what prompted you initially, because I think you got started even before neighborhood beautification was in existence. Well, what started, well, we have several lots. We have one that we just initiated that will be a it's called the community serenity pavilion um it's outdoor it's going to be an outdoor cooking space for the community and people with disabilities to come and you can pick fresh herbs and you can you can you can eat you can sit and socialize you can probably do art there you can you know it's just a place of relaxation any type of place that holistically reaches the community and the individual regardless of their age or their abilities it it it, it reaches that that's what that pavilion space does we have also a um, garden that's called Creative Empowerment Garden. Um, the structure was donated to us by Charles H. Wright. It runs completely on solar. It's an outdoor solar movie theater. And if the power goes out in our community, people can come there and plug up their uh, laptops, their phones, their um, emergency equipment for um health reasons so that we've been had that ever since 2018 thank you charles h right i'm shouting out to you yes. <laughs> and that structure yes. explain the structure of the of the community oh, it's it's it, it was created by aaron jones and it's like a tp with like these like wiggly type lines inside of the um of the panels and what you do our projectors go inside of this space and it projects the movie outward um, and it's it's something that nobody has ever e- never have, ever seen. I've got to get over there. It's you you, you, you got to check. When we have a movie night, I'm going to invite you guys yeah. so you can come and see it. It's unbelievable. It sounds like sci-fi. We're going to watch Star Wars. On it. I, I want to watch Star Wars yeah. on it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Or either you know, like beautiful colors. Yeah. In the, in the winter time, what we do is like around Christmas, we plug it up for um, like Christmas lights to like yeah. bounce the colors off. So it's it's pretty cool, you guys. Oh, and, and we also have a bird watcher's garden a bird watchers yes garden. Where, where the community can come and watch birds they can um talk about you know different um things in the community um uh as far as um the 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 animals that are that are a part of our um, community in jefferson chalmers yeah and just one quick question tammy before we let you go here because this is such a great conversation we can keep going the entire yes. show actually yes. but i just wanted to know just go back to you talked a little bit about families coming from mississippi arkansas yes. the south and we ha- we saw mm-hmm. the great migration moving forward mm-hmm. and i think oftentimes about the third spaces that were mm-hmm. lost a lot of the those third spaces within our mm-hmm. communities were the church and mm-hmm. a lot of this, we've seen a lot of the the church we've seen it go down attendance right. to churches go down so right. we've seen a lot of our third spaces that we were known to to, to come together in kind of right. go away right. so talk about creating those third spaces once again so we can come together as a community I I feel like all of these spaces that I create are those third spaces you know what I mean like uh, in the south or when when you first came here to Detroit with your family everybody was welcome everybody could come and eat if they didn't have anything to eat you know everybody could come and and you socialize together so those are the type of spaces that I want to create and I want our young people to know I think we lost that somewhere yeah. and we need to bring that back it needs to come back so that's my goal is to bring those type of spaces for us back 
so we can gain that collaboration that we used to have, that togetherness that we that we've been missing for years that was there then. You know, you could you could come home from school and, and your parents be at work and you know your neighbor's gonna look out for you. Miss mm-hmm. Jones is gonna be right. right there. You better not take nobody in that house <laughs> and Miss Jones, you done took them in there and your mother and daddy, your father and mother not there. <laughs> right. But <laughs> you in trouble. Right. Come in the house, no. You know what I'm saying? So you know, we, we need to get that back. And I also wanted to mention another space that we're doing. It's a solar training house. We finished our first cohort of training people of how to implement solar installation. Our solar training house, we got a $100,000 through crowdfunding to finish this house. And I want to invite everybody else once it's completed. It'll be ran off of the solar power connected to the grid as well. But there'll be no gas in this house. Mitsubishi is donating the the design and the product to make this house run just completely off electrical, no gas, heat, and electrical. Mm. Wow. Yes. And when will that one be complete and when will the tree we, house be we, complete? We're, we're looking for that to be completed by the end of the year, the house, but maybe by the spring. So we're working with our contractors right now to see when can we get that totally completed. But we're doing the ground mount solar outside of it right now. Um, the tree house, we're looking at we want to start on it in September, but we 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 we're working with the numbers right now. That's what that's our goal. Tammy Black, longtime advocate and the founder of the Manistee Community Treehouse. Tammy, thanks so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you for having me. This is the Metro on 1019 WDET-FM. Coming up, we'll talk about National Ice Cream Day this Sunday and a special event that's happening in North End. You stay right there. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at the University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new Master of Science degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. Admission is open to qualified applicants with a bachelor's degree in any field. Course selection is flexible with no prerequisites, four required courses, and six electives. Learn more at business.udmercy.edu. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET-FM. I am Tia Graham, once again joined by Vicki Thomas, Director of Communications for the City of Detroit. And Vicki, ice cream. Yes, as you know, (laughs) we've been talking about it all week like little kids. Uh, But Sunday is National Ice Cream Day. Mm -hmm. That means we're all screaming for ice cream, including MJ's North End Ice Cream Parlor, which is a family-owned neighborhood store in Detroit, and they're hosting a special event on Sunday to celebrate and to get the ice cream party started. Mm -hmm. We're joined by MJ's North End Ice Cream Parlor marketing manager, Amber Justice, known to regulars as AJ, and she's MJ's oldest daughter, right? Yes, thank you so much, yes. Hey, welcome to the program, AJ. We appreciate, I appreciate you for having us today. We do. Um, MJ is currently on vacation, so he sends his love. So me and my sister are holding down the shop here. Um, so we do appreciate this. Thank you, guys. Well, you guys yes. must be great to be able to let Dad go off and uh, yes. do his thing and you hold it down. Yeah, we got to give him some <laughs> vacation time sometime. Yes. Yes. Day off. Okay. And, yeah. uh uh, AJ, uh, talk about uh, your dad a little bit, MJ, who in, who he is, and how did he get the business started? So it is like a story out of a dream, honestly, um, because we grew up in the neighborhood. I used to bring my sons there to get ice cream. Um, little known fact, the ice cream shop has actually been an ice cream shop for about 30 years. Mm. So prior to us taking over ownership about four years ago, um, it was known as Miss Vicky's, and the neighborhood knew it as Miss Vicky's. Yes, that sounds familiar. Yo, pun intended. Yeah. Miss Vicky's. Yeah. Miss Vicky's. Yeah. So, um, um, from there, uh, before that, I think it was a Dairy King, but it was closed for a little bit. Um, so Miss Vicky is, uh, she's the one who was able to 
reestablish that um, and get it back started. And it is a staple within that community. Um, and it is very, uh, very important space. So not just ice cream um, is not what it's just there for. It's actually a place for community to gather um, and to not just eat good ice cream, but good food and celebrate the neighborhood. So um, M- oh, MJ, I'm sorry, I got off track, but MJ well, is a retired uh, chemical engineer um, who was, you know, looking for the next move in 2021, and this just fell on our doorstep. So, actually, our neighbor across the street, Ms. Vicky, was actually selling, and that's how we got involved, and is a family-owned, family-ran operation. So, it's strictly just all of us that's behind it. And MJ's is a new recipient of a 2024 Yay. Motor City Match Restore Award. Yes. Uh, talk about that and what you plan to to use that award for. Okay, so we um we were very much aware of Motor City Match and what it's been doing for business owners and community. So we were super excited trying to figure out how could we apply for this. And the opportunity happened this year where we were actually got all the ducks in a row um, and were able to go ahead and apply for their restore track, which is going to help us build out our outdoor space a little more for community um, events because we want to be, like I said, a place to host, whether it's block clubs, parties, um, for like little open mics, things like that within the neighborhood, within that little space. So we will be doing a completely rebranding of the outside space. Nice. That's awesome. When do we expect to see that? Like, ooh, well, yeah. So we love our customers and we want to stay open. So we are thinking about that at the end of the season. Because yeah. I would love to do it now, but MJ's like, no, how are people going to get ice cream? So <laughs> thinking about that, we're going to wait until we shut down in October and then go ahead and proceed with that. Nice. And let's talk about the main thing, the ice, ice cream. cream. Yes. <laughs> yes. How, how is it made? Okay, so we are, we like I said, we acquired the shop. Um, It was it wasn't broke, so we weren't going to fix it. So we kept their same vendors for ice cream. Um, but once again, I did say MJ is a chemical engineer, so yeah. he's trying. He's like, we're trying to keep him back. He wants to go ahead and try his hand at making ice cream. Um, but right now it is, uh, uh, we do buy ours from a Hershey's vendor. Which is just so interesting. Um, and I just think about all the flavors. What type of flavor? What's the most popular flavor? Ooh, banana pudding. Okay. Yes, we actually received a write-up in the free press about that banana pudding. It will change your life. You have banana pudding soft serve? No. So we are hand-packed. Oh, my so gosh. We so that's the most important thing to talk yes, about. Yes. Thank you. So we are <laughs> hand-packed ice cream. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Meaning that we are back there scooping that ice cream. And we have, like, the hearty chunks of... Um, the, in, in the banana uh, pudding, it's the hearty chunks of the cookies, the vanilla wafers, every little bite with the marshmallow swerving through it. Um, that's a popular flavor. Our flavor of the month is Coffee House Cookies and Cream, which we allow for our community to vote on, and that was what was nice. voted in for July, and that is amazing. Um, in addition to, we have options for our vegans out there. So if you are non-dairy, guess what? We have it for you. We do sorbets, and they are amazing as well. Um, so we have a lemon sorbet, raspberry sorbet, and we're looking into getting more sorbets as well as vegan food options, guys. So please check out our menu. That's awesome. And what do you have planned for National Ice Cream Day? What are you going to be doing? So I that banana pudding I spoke about, people come and buy it by the pints. Like I had somebody buy like three pints at one time, try to hide it in their freezer. So we're going to do a discount on our pints. So our pints are going to be um, two for 20. Our half wow. pints are going to be two for 10. And then we're also, we also do Sunday, 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 where it's a, you know, we take a dollar off all of our Sundays. Um, and that's how we're going to be celebrating ice cream. We're trying to have you take some home as well as eat some there. <laughs> That's Love awesome. So very much. <laughs> That's yeah. AJ, the marketing manager at MJ's North End Ice Cream Parlor. AJ, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's if I can mention other because, like I said, we're more than just ice cream. So, for example, we do have a bar crawl at the end of the month um, coming up on the Saturday uh, 27th, July 27th, because we are very intentional about making sure that we spend our dollar within our neighborhood to generate more business opportunities as well as um, we have a DJ the last Friday, which is kid-friendly. Um, and we also have um, uh, our celebration for our four-year anniversary, the Yay. 31st. All right. Well, uh, happy National Ice Cream Day to everyone at MJ's. Thanks Thank again you. for being on the show, AJ. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you.
It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. Vicki Thomas is here. I'm Tia Graham. Today, a high of 80 degrees with sunny skies. Tomorrow, Saturday, mostly sunny with a high around 84 degrees. And Sunday, temperatures are expected to reach 85 degrees and will remain partly cloudy, which means if you are headed out this weekend, you want to go to Concert of Colors? You're going to have a beautiful weather forecast for you as you head on out there this weekend to that cultural district. And Vicki, as well, if you want to go get ice cream Sunday, you can go get some ice cream. I will, and I might have to go to MJ's. They get the the, the banana pudding. She <laughs> yes. says there's a banana pudding ice cream with cookie crumbles in it. Like banana- I, I, That sounds amazing. Yeah, I'll wait in line for that. <laughs> I'll wait for that. However... As we continue on, President Joe Biden right now is not terribly popular in the polls, not as popular as he would like, but Detroit's transit office is celebrating him anyway. That's because the city's Department of Transportation office is using $30 million from bipartisan infrastructure law passed Biden to acquire 21 new hybrid and four hydrogen buses. We are joined by the director of the Department of Transportation for the city of Detroit, and we're going to have him on as soon as we get back from this break. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. I am here with Vicki Thomas, the Director of Communications for the City of Detroit. As always, thank you so much for being here this week. It's been great, Tia. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Now, we were talking a little bit about city buses, the Department of Transportation. That office is using $30 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law passed under Biden to acquire 21 new hybrid and four hydrogen buses. Now, the city says that it wants to acquire these buses to both clean up its fleet and to compare them with four all-electric buses they already have. So... When will the city be able to deploy these buses? What kinds of improvements will they offer? And what will it take to expand the number of clean buses the city has? To discuss all this, we have interim director of the department, excuse me, of the Detroit Department of Transportation, Michael Staley here. Director Staley, welcome to the Metro. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, of course. So what was the process like for getting the funding for the bipartisan infrastructure law? Did you all have to apply for this funding or or did it just come down? It is a uh, it was a federal transit administration grant uh, that uh, we were made aware of shortly after the beginning of 2024. Uh, I had a deadline of April of 2024. So uh, with a combined effort um, through the office of the mayor and some in-house expertise, uh, we were able to apply for the grant uh, by the deadline at the end of April. And quite honestly, we're a little bit surprised at how quickly the award was announced. Yeah, yeah. And what are the new features of these hybrid buses and hydrogen buses, especially with the funding that you all were uh, able to receive? So the 21 uh, hybrid will be uh, diesel electric. Uh, and the four, as you mentioned earlier, will be hydrogen buses. So um, diesel electric versus a uh, uh, traditional diesel bus uh, has about 30% less on the fuel consumption and about less than half of the uh, carbon output of a regular diesel bus. So is there an indication right now that they're more durable than your diesel buses? The expectation is that uh, the useful life on a transit coach, uh, which is currently 12 years or 500,000 miles, will be no different for the uh, for the hybrids and uh, no different for the hydrogen. All right. And DDOT is purchasing 21 new hybrid buses, as we said, as well as those four hydrogen ones. Those are supposed to arrive by 2026. When do you think we'll uh, have those buses up and running? Uh, we expect delivery to take place in the summer of 26, and they'll be deployed into service immediately. Awesome, awesome. And, and what will yeah, it go mean ahead. Um, for service, Michael? Um, given the fact that uh, it, they will be replacing the 2014 uh, vehicles, uh, which will be coming up to the end of their useful life. Typically what occurs as a bus gets to the end of its useful life, just like as your car gets to the end of its useful life, uh, requires more maintenance, less reliability. And so uh, with uh, 21 new uh, hybrids and four new hydrogens, uh, it should serve uh, to improve service reliability. Yeah. And what are the differences between the hybrid hydrogen and fully electric buses? Besides the fact that they're fully electric buses um, are the cleanest, are you trying to to decide which ones you guys want to go with more? So um, DDOT has a plan in place that after uh, 2037, it will purchase no more um, diesel buses. uh, And by 2015, the fleet will be entirely zero emission. 
So what uh, this purchase will allow us to do is evaluate uh, what the zero emission bus future will look like in the city of Detroit. So as you mentioned, we currently have four electric vehicles. Uh, with the addition of four hydrogen vehicles, we will be able to do a side-by-side -side comparison on any number of fronts to see which direction we want to move in. We expect uh, up to 2037 that future purchases of buses will um, by and large be um, uh, hybrid, the, uh, the diesel electric, and then we'll begin to phase in a larger and larger proportion of either electric or hydro hydrogen or some combination thereof. Okay, so um, when we think about going fully electric and not doing it right right now, is it because of the timeline that you all have set up for yourselves so that 2037 to, to slowly uh, see how it works? You know, yeah. if, you take, if you take the current generation of the fleet, which basically spans from uh, 2012s uh, up to 2023, that fits uh, perfectly with that 2037 goal so that as we replace each portion of the current generation of the fleet, as I said, we'll start out with the uh, with the vast majority being uh, hybrids, and then we'll begin to, uh, after our evaluation period, begin to determine if we want to go uh, more in the electric di uh, direction or more in the hydrogen direction. Perfect. We're chatting with Michael Staley, Director for Detroit's Department of Transportation Office, and we're speaking about a grant that the department got to purchase a bunch of hybrid and hydrogen buses. And, and during a press conference recently uh, for this announcement about purchasing hybrid buses, Mayor Duggan had this to say about your department. With the job Michael Staley's done, we have 150 more bus drivers working today than we did a year ago. We're fixing the old buses we have, but with the help of the Biden administration, we have 45 new buses coming in next year, and now 25 buses coming in with today's announcement in 2026. We're going to replace a quarter of the entire fleet in the next two years. This is going to allow us to continue to expand bus service to residents in the city of Detroit, and this is life and death to our community. And I know that you want to operate zero emission buses and lower the wait times for buses along major routes. How quickly do you uh, see this happening and what kinds of hoops will you have to jump through to get to the city to get the city there? Um, as the mayor mentioned, the first issue, uh, I've been in the business for about 40 years. I haven't learned much, but I've learned two things. <laughs> you need vehicles, you need drivers. Mm -hmm. And without one or without the other, uh, you're not going to be able to put service out on the street. So the first uh, First challenge we had was the transit equipment operator, bus driver, uh, headcount. And uh, while I appreciate the shout out from the mayor, it was really through his direction uh, and uh, a $3 across the board wage increase on the base wage and an additional $500 incentive bonus per quarter that really allowed HR and the recruiting department of the city um, to help us uh, recruit, hire, and train 150 new transit equipment equipment operators between October 2023 and uh, June of 2024. That was the first step. Next step was, and again, as the uh, mayor had mentioned, about vehicle availability uh, with the 2012 fleet at the end of its useful life, 2014 fleet coming up on the end of its useful life. The next challenge is going to be vehicle availability. So uh, we're working uh, very diligently uh, to maintain the current fleet Admittedly, we're a, a bit behind the curve on the replacement of the 2012 fleet. That won't happen until uh, next summer. Um, that should have taken place this summer. Uh, I think COVID uh, interfered with uh, that procurement plan. But nevertheless, uh, we're working to, uh, to continue to increase the number of available vehicles every day. That has a direct impact on the reliability of the service. And the SOAR Fund would invest a lot of money in public spaces like transit and housing. And Mayor Duggan referenced it at a news conference as well on these buses. If I can put in one side pitch for Governor Whitmer, uh, the only thing stopping us now from dramatically expanding the number of buses on the street is the state of Michigan's SOAR legislation, which is stuck in the legislature. It would provide permanent funding for transit to cities across the state of Michigan. Uh, and with the new buses that we have coming in, we can put more service on the street. How big of a deal would it be for Detroit if the SOAR fund legislation were to, to pass? As the mayor mentioned, additional money is means equates to uh, more service on the street. So um, he's provided us with a directive that he wants the department to uh, increase service uh, to pre-pandemic levels by the end of this year. So in January of this year, uh, we went from 135 to 150 pullouts. In June, we went up to 
168 pullouts. Uh, in September, we'll go up to 175 pullouts. And then by January of 2025, our goal is to get to 200 uh, pullouts every morning. Wow, wow, wow. And where are we on our way to that goal? Right now, we just had our uh, latest uh, operator pick. That's when uh, drivers pick their assignments. Uh, that took place on uh, the 24th of June, and we're up to 168 uh, a.m. pullouts every day. Nice. And, and will, uh, will you, in fact, be able to create a cleaner fleet and add more buses on the roads without the SOAR fund passing? Uh, we will, okay. uh, but it would certainly help with the uh, with the SOAR funding, no question about it. Indeed. And my last question before we let you go, DDOT struggled a lot through the pandemic to keep bus drivers and, and maintain a durable fleet of buses. What are you doing now to expand the number of bus drivers and bus services that you have? Again, as I mentioned, uh, the $3 base wage increase and the additional uh, incentive bonus has been instrumental in us being able to uh, expand the ranks of the TEOs. Our retention uh, rate is pretty good. We're losing about uh, six or seven um, operators per month. Uh, we will continue to uh, have training classes approximately every six to eight weeks uh, with at least 40 people in those classes. HR recruitment's done a, a magnificent job in finding uh, appropriate individuals to enter the training classes. Michael Staley is the interim director for Detroit's Department of Transportation. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metro and giving us the rundown on the buses. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. We'll talk about the Hoop Fest event happening today and what it means for residents in the Northwest Goldberg neighborhood. It's the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. It's a Friday. Unfortunately, it's Vicky's last day. Oh. Guest hosting on the Metro with us. And Vicky, it's been a pleasure. Once again, it's been a pleasure. It's been great working uh, with you, uh, Tia. And this experience, like I said, it's like coming home. Yeah. Worked here at WDET back in the late 80s, <laughs> early 90s. So, yeah, it's great seeing everyone that, that are folks that are still here from way back then. I was going to say Jerome Vaughn still still <laughs> holding down the fort. <laughs> but I think about holding down the fort and I think about different things in the city of Detroit. And when you walk around Detroit during the summer, it's a completely different experience than any other season. The sun is shining. People are out. There are all kinds of interactions happening, including a range of parties and barbecues and outdoor activities. And one of those celebrations is Hoop Fest which starts today in the Northwest Goldberg neighborhood of Detroit. The three-day event includes free food trucks, giveaways, competitions, and special guests, including basketball celebrity Chris, Chris Weber and Detroit rapper Baby Money. To talk about the second annual event and why he's excited about it, we have Daniel Washington here. Daniel is the executive director and founder of the Northwest Goldberg Cares, a community organization that sits east of I-96 and west of the Lodge. Daniel, welcome to the Metro. Thanks for having me. How are you all today? We're Doing great. great. Doing Good to great. see you on this lovely Friday. Indeed. Likewise. Likewise. Indeed. I always ask folks, especially at the top, if you're from the city of Detroit, what side are you from? West side. Uh, born and raised in Northwest Goldberg. So. All right. All right. I love that too, so much. West side as well for myself. Vicky. West, well, West side. West side. All right. So what is Hoop Fest and why do residents gravitate towards it? For sure. So Hoop Fest is a three-day event that's really celebrating the building of Curtis Jones Park, built in 2022. Uh, celebrating the life of Curtis Jones, a neighborhood legend and really a DPS legend. If you don't know a story, Google it. <laughs> and then also just a good time for kids. You know, when you think about when I grew up, you know, you had uh, everything from Arts Beats and Eats, which, you know, was outside of the city. But then you also had Taste Fest, which was right there um, on West Grand Boulevard. And we don't have some of those things anymore. So we really aim to make this an event for the summer, for the youth, for the kids, for families to be able to come out, everything for free and for them just to enjoy themselves. You brought up Taste Fest that fast. My brain instantly went like, I remember doing that. And my brain just went blank. Like, oh, my yes. gosh, Taste Fest. I forgot even hearing that. You're right. We did have that <laughs> yes, growing we up. we did. We loved it. We sure we did. Loved it. loved it. 
So how did this particular event get in, get started? I know it was in honor of Curtis Jones, who was a legend in the city of Detroit, yeah. DPS as well, uh, amazing basketball player. Um, but how did this get started? Yeah, so I mean, it really was just, you know, after three years of really uh, just struggling to figure out how we can fund the creation of Curtis Jones Park, which, you know, let's be clear, it's an active lifestyle park. Um, we had great support from Gilbert Family Foundation, from Kellogg, from Skillman, from so many other funders. But with that being said, it took three years to raise the funds to be able to build a court in our neighborhood. We hadn't had a court in our neighborhood since I was a child. So, you know, when we built it two years ago, I'm 30 this year, 28. You're talking about since I was 14, we had no basketball court Mm -hmm. in sight in our neighborhood. And it was a tragedy. unbelievable. It's unbelievable, right? (laughs) So you think about the Pistons coming down and all the excitement in the news, and we were struggling for two and a half to three years to get funding to build this. And it just really just took off from there. You know, when we finally built the court, we said, we need to do something to celebrate this. This is a momentous occasion. We don't need to just forget, right? Of course, it's open and accessible. But how do we uplift that this was built? You know what I mean? And we were able to do something that, again, against all odds. So we were able to uh, fundraise nearly 500 grand, uh, built this NBA-sized basketball court, a world-class playground for our kids and a walk path, 10 laps equal a mile. And we said we're going to make sure that we celebrate this every year. I am like just like my mind has so many different questions right now because number one, I want the audience and I want folks listening to know who Curtis Jones was and why he was so important, why you decided to honor him and his legacy. Um, but then the importance of yourself, you're being you're a Detroiter, you grew up in that neighborhood, you stayed in your neighborhood and you build and and created a, a new space for your community. So number one, who was Curtis Jones? And then number two, why is it so important that you yourself in particular have built this particular space in your community? For sure. So Curtis Jones is a prolific uh, player that came out of Northwestern High School. Um, he hit the game winning shot in the first televised game for DPS. Some say he was better than Magic Johnson. Believe it or not, I got the recommendation from Yusef Bunchy Shakur, uh, an activist in our neighborhood, yeah. who said, hey, if you never heard this man's story, you need to look it up. Um, and when I and I said, say less. So when I found out about his story, I said, we need to honor this man, right? Instead of just focusing on negative, you know, truth be told, unfortunately, he couldn't read past the fourth grade reading level, allegedly. So even though he was so talented and got a full ride to University of Michigan, when they found out his lack of literacy, they said, hey, go to JUCO, go to junior college, figure it out. And unfortunately, he succumbed to the peer pressure. Somebody allegedly spiked his drink or spiked a substance. And he unfortunately, you know, died in 1999 due to uh, drug addiction and just mental health issues. So his story is tragic, but we want to uplift the other side of it. Right. This guy loved kids. He loved his neighborhood. He loved the game of basketball. And that's something that we need our kids to remember. Right. We need our kids to understand that, you know, there's a tragedy, but there's also beauty in knowing that somebody cared that much up until his death about them and about kids. And, you know, you talk to people who grew up with them, they'll tell you that to this, you know, to his death, he kept saying, I'm going to build a, a court one day and I'm going to, you know, what I mean, get back to the kid. So we're just trying to uplift that part of him. And we don't want his story to be forgotten. We don't want it to be something that just gets pushed to the side and, and something that his family can't be proud of because he was indeed according to some better than magic johnson and we all know and revere magic johnson here in the state that's a big yeah that's big big and we're speaking with daniel washington the executive director and founder of the northwest goldberg cares and we're discussing hoop fest a three-day community event that starts today and you have chris weber fab five yeah attending how'd you make that happen man shout out to our council president mary sheffield she made it happen you know i'm not gonna take no credit for that you know uh (laughs) we came to council president about a year ago now we said listen you know what we went through to build this court you know we were able to get some neighbor um some neighbor dollars you know that they put out and you know we want to make sure that we do this thing right and she said listen i want to partner with you if i can you know bring my occupy the corner you know event to your space, that would be amazing, and let's figure out how to make it happen. So this is two years in a row that we're working with her. Last year we had Skilla Baby, this year we had Baby Money and Chris Weber, and we're just super excited, right? And the, and the big, the, the fun part about this is that Chris Weber speaks to the older residents, right? Those who watched Fab Five growing up or right. just en- enjoy just all the stories. I watched the Fab Five. There you go. There so what go. are you trying to say? So what I'm saying is for everybody, come on out. You know, aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, come on out. It's for the whole hood, you know. And that's really the point, right? And then we have Baby Money, you know, uh, a guy who grew up not far away. You know, a lot of kids, a lot of, you know, uh, children in our neighborhood, you know, admire the work that he does and, and the music that he makes. And we just want to make sure it's, it's welcoming to everybody, right? So that's yeah. really what we're aiming to do. It All sounds right. like that's when you great. talk about Chris Weber and then you go to Baby Money. I'm like, that's everybody. Everybody's that's everybody. covered. Everybody. Yeah. We're all it's covered. It's inclusive, right? Yeah. right? There you go. We're all covered.
Yeah. <laughs> so great. So, Daniel, once again, as we continue to go on, talk a little bit about the Northwest Goldberg neighborhood itself. What makes it so special? Um, what makes the residents special, the community special, especially continuing on with Hoop Fest? For sure. I mean, so first and foremost, you know, Northwest Goldberg is just a very historic neighborhood in, in nature, right? So it's home to Motown Sound. You know, everybody in Detroit loved him some Motown. But it also is home to Six Seven Riots, you know, believe it or not. You know, the city of Detroit didn't really recognize the Six Seven Riots until about 2017, which was a travesty. But one thing that gets forgotten is that we, to this day, still have an armory in our neighborhood because of that um, horrific event, you being 67 riots. So um, it's a place where, you know, a lot of, you know, aging residents, you know, primarily African American, have succumbed to just the, the disproportionate economic, you know, systemic racism that happens, right? So a lot of people in our neighborhood haven't been given opportunities that others have seen, but we're starting to see, right? Because of Henry Ford Health and because of other interests, we're starting to see some excitement. But for me, as a kid who was born and raised there, it's about really providing resources and opportunities to my neighbors, right? Understanding that, you know, kids and the elderly residents oftentimes are the most marginalized group of people in society, right? Um, and, and, it's, and, it, and it takes courage to be able to step up for them and say, hey, they deserve to be heard. They deserve to have representation. They deserve quality things, you know? I really pride myself on saying black people deserve nice stuff too, right? I have an explicit <laughs> way of saying that. But, you know, for the radio, you know, black people deserve nice stuff too. And that's what we aim to do is we try to create real wholesome programming, wholesome places and spaces, and just give back to our neighborhood the best way we can. And this event runs today through the weekend. How? Um, uh, give us a little bit about the three-day event, a little bit more, some of the things that people can expect, and especially when they can stop by and see Chris Weber. Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, come out and eat. I tell everybody, come out and eat. Everything is free. So we got everything, you know, shout out to Pepsi for, you know, plugging us with water and Gatorades and Brisk Teas. Um, no pop. Um, so if you got a you know, sweet tooth, my bad. But we also <laughs> have a slew of food trucks. We have Hero and Villains. We have Slow's Barbecue. We have Pablo's Tacos, all completely free, right? So we want you to come out and enjoy. Um, but we also have competitions, which we made sure are intentionally geared toward youth and then, of course, adults, right? So making sure that our babies get an opportunity to win. We got a Nintendo DS that's available to win. We got Pistons tickets. Shout out to the Pistons for showing us some love. Uh, we got brand new shoes that we're giving out today as well as on Sunday. So, you know, kids and families can come out and get a brand new pair of shoes and box. Um, then we have a live performance Saturday. So this is adults only, 21 and up. You know, we're going to have some liquor for y'all. We're going to have some good tunes, DJ Gifted and others. And we're just going to, you know, show have a good time. So all in all, the three-day event is pretty simple. The first two days are more geared toward the youth. We have a girls-only clinic this year, which is new, and we're nice. excited about that. Um, so we're uh, partnering with the Detroit Dodgers. Super excited for that partnership. And then on Sunday is the all-family event, right? So we have a celebrity game, uh, Team Sheffield versus Baby Money. Um, we'll have, of course, um, special guest Jaden Aikens coming out as well. Um, his dad is from around the way. He's a Michigan State uh, star. So we just tried to make sure that we just kept we just kept that momentum and that energy from last year, right? And we just want to keep building it up and making it more exciting. And what's the location again? So the location is 1941 Ferry Park, Detroit, Michigan, 48208, Curtis Jones Park. All right. All righty then. Daniel Washington, executive director and founder of Northwest Goldberg Cares, a community organization that exists east of 96, west of the Lodge. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro and talking about Hoop Fest 2024. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. All right. And best of luck with the event. That's the Metro for Friday, July 19th. I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Vicki Thomas for guest hosting on the Metro this week. Once again, Director of Communications for the city of Detroit is her full-time job. Her other job is just being amazing all the time. That's the <laughs> oh, other job. Thank you. <laughs> but coming up in the next few weeks, we'll hear from Orlando Bailey, the executive director of Outlier Media, Robin Vinton of Chalkbeat. We'll have Jake Neer of Automotive News for, for Cranes. We'll have Colin Jackson with Michigan Public Radio Network. And next week, starting Monday, we'll have Malachi Barrett, a reporter for Bridge Detroit. But until then, you can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast podcast on your favorite platform and the show is also on youtube if you like listening to that and the show is produced by sam Corey, david lyons and jack phil brandt additional production support from anel scott and sydney walkley our engineer is nate bender music by sam bobian and will sessions 
the Metro is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and you want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. This is WDET-FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Thanks so much for listening. This is the time, Vicki. I just want you to just, once again, thank you so much for being here, Vicki Thomas, this whole entire week. It's been like a master class sitting across from you, <laughs> learning from a mentor, from a legend in the industry, first black woman inducted into the Hall of Fame for radio, and uh, Michigan Hall of Fame of broadcast. So just want to say thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, Tia. Your team is amazing. Too. Sam. That's Nate. Sam Corey. <laughs> that Sam Corey is something. <laughs>